millions of people have sleep apnea and many don't know it. Joining us tonight for our Your Health segment is Dr. Rodney Taylor, Associate Professor of Otorhinolaryngology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Ear, Nose and Throat Surgeon at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for having me, Jeff. When we talk about sleep apnea, that is, that is something more than just uh, not getting a good night's sleep. Uh, definitely. And sleep apnea, really, what it is, is there's an effort being made to breathe when you're sleeping. However, the walls in the back of the throat have collapsed. And so despite that effort for variable lengths of time, a person isn't breathing, but they don't know it. And while snoring is associated with it, uh, sleep apnea is something that uh, can be far more harmful than just simple snoring. How does somebody know if they have it? It can be difficult. Um, because you're asleep. Cor right. Correct, right. and particularly if you sleep by yourself. Um, there is virtually no way to know it when you sleep by yourself, and studies show that even if you have a bed partner, you can't know for sure. So there is one definitive way, and the way to do it is to have a sleep study. And it actually measures a variety of measures while you're asleep, including exactly when you fall asleep, whether you're making an effort to breathe, what your oxygen level is, and your heart rate, and some of the other factors that can be important to know when someone stops breathing. Is it is the, the, the cause, the mechanism, is it related to snoring? Is, are some of the same issues at work? Uh, there, there are, and it's a, a way to think about it is it's a continuum. And so snoring is actually when you're having some partial collapse, but you're getting enough air in to breathe in your lungs and support your body and your body's needs. With sleep apnea, there is complete cessation of breathing. And so it's just a matter of extent, if you will. And it happens at the same place. And so some people think that sleep apnea can happen because you have a deviated septum or so, but no. It's at the back of your throat. And the tissue at the back of your tongue, the sides of uh, the walls of your throat, literally collapse. And it's at that area that sleep apnea happens. Does it happen uh, predominantly to, to people who maybe are a little bit overweight? Uh, so there are some risk factors, and that's perhaps the most common one. And uh, for example, if you have a large neck, that's one of the best predictors, actually. And so for people who have a large neck, they've got a lot of extra tissue in the back of the throat, more narrow passages, and so they're at risk. Um, other people who are at risk, for example, are those folks who may have uh, small jaw bones and a relatively narrow space to fit their tongue and other normal structures. And so, uh, and then finally, people who wind up uh, uh, having relaxants like alcohol or medication and things like that can also put you at risk. Let me remind our viewers, if you have a question about sleep apnea, please give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You can also tweet a question on Twitter. Our address is at MPT News. We also have a couple of viewer questions on tape. Here's one from Mitch. I've always wondered why. Why do people sleepwalk? Is that related at all? Or not, is it? not at all. A different sleep disorder, Mitch. Uh, uh, one that I don't see a lot of folks who, uh, who sleepwalk. It's uh, not related at all to sleep apnea. The, the people you do see for, for sleep apnea, you're, you're a surgeon. Yes. So what can you do for them? It's a great question. And so Though I'm a surgeon and I love to operate, uh, one of the things I do is I try not to, I try to talk them out of surgery um, because uh, the, uh, the information that we have lets us know that there are other treatments that tend to be more reliably superior. Uh, for example, something that's called CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. Is that and the mask? That's the mask. And the idea is that at the time during the cycle of breathing that the tissues of the throat would collapse, you're getting a little bit of air forced, whereby it stents the tissues from completely collapsing. And how, how effective is that? Um, and, it, and secondly, how uncomfortable is that <laughs> to, to try to go to sleep with a mask on your face? There are some people, Jeff, despite their highest motivation, cannot tolerate it. They may be claustrophobic or just can't get used to it. But for those who can tolerate it, um, it can be quite effective and certainly an effectiveness that is in excess of 90 or 95 percent if you wear it. Uh, but there are many who can and they're the folks really who we wind up considering for surgical procedures. Uh, let's take a phone call. This is Mike in Washington, D.C. Mike, thanks for the call. Go ahead. 
Yes, sir. I had the operation for sleep apnea, and uh, also sleep was it was a sleep sleep pack machine, sleep pack machine, <laughs> and uh, I also had my, my throat cleared out for the excess fat, and I had my um, bottom bottom part of my um, chin broke. But I still suffer from a pretty bad, and I fall asleep in the evening time. I wonder if there's any, anything else I can do. Mike, thanks Thank very you. much for the call. Good luck to you. Right, sure. And to answer Mike's question, the uh, success of surgery has a lot to do with how severe is the street, uh, sleep apnea to begin with. And for those who have severe sleep apnea, uh, generally speaking, most of those people will not be best candidates for surgery. Just because the surgical uh, procedures that we have uh, at our availability aren't highly effective for patients with severe sleep apnea, whereas CPAP is much more effective. What's the, the surgical procedure? What, what do you do? Uh, there are a variety geared at increasing the space in the back of the throat, and Mike alluded to a couple. So the most common workhorse procedure, if you will, is something that's called a uvulopalatal pharyngoplasty. And Easy with that procedure, say, right? um, you literally uh, trim the, the lower part of the soft palate, which is part of that tissue at the back of the throat that can contribute to the collapse. Perhaps the second most common procedure we do is actually, as Mike said, you drill a hole through the bottom of the jawbone, and the tongue actually attaches there in the front. And you can pull it out, usually uh, about a couple of centimeters or so, and then re-secure that bone and now you've given that person additional space in the back of their throat to help prevent collapse. Wow. And so they're the two most common in adults uh, that we do. A lot of phone calls here. Let's talk to Stacy in Washington County. Stacy, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Hi, I have a child diagnosed with sleep apnea and it was diagnosed through a sleep study. They have a history of um, epilepsy and ADHD. Stacy, you said a child? Yes, seven year old. Wow. And, and so, uh, Stacy, uh, uh, sleep apnea is common in adults and children, and it's a little different. It's by still the same definition. It's collapse at the back of the throat. But in over 90% of kids, the singular reason for obstructive sleep apnea is because the tonsils and adenoids are too big. And so nowadays, whereas when we were younger, you would take your tonsils out mostly if you had a certain number of affections. Today, eight or nine out of every 10 tonsillectomy and adenoidectomies we do are because of pe patients who have obstructive sleep apnea, kids. It turns out that by the time you become an adult, tonsils and adenoids are such a small contributor to the space you have back there that that isn't the simple fix that it often is for kids. You, you said uh, when people sleep alone, frequently they don't know they have it. When, when they sleep with a partner, what is the partner seeing? What's the tip Absolutely. off? Absolutely. And so the partner is first and foremost going to notice snoring. But there's going to be a, a sort of long spaces within the sound you hear in snoring, and that's when they're not breathing. And then once the breath comes, there may be a snorting or a gagging sound that the partner hears where finally the person is able to generate enough pressure to open back up the tissues in the back of the throat that have collapsed. And do, so that's very common. Does sleeping position matter if it somebody's does. on their back versus on their side absolutely. or the front? Absolutely. Sleeping on the back um, absolutely makes sleep apnea worse. And there are people who don't really have sleep apnea at all who if they sleep on their back, they may have some obstruction. Sleeping on the side is the preferred method in that uh, gravity isn't pulling the tissue of the back of the tongue and so forth uh, downward in the collapsing uh, motion. Uh, so the side is the preferred position to, uh, for anyone who has snoring or sleep apnea. Uh, Mary in Berkeley County, West Virginia. Mary, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my question is that when I was camping, I heard this guy, and he was supposed to have one of those masks on, and then um, I was farther away from him, so I don't know if he was gagging and stuff, but he was snoring while he had this mask on. Does that mean that the mask had fallen off? Thank you. Uh, so, Mary, it, it could be that the mask uh, fell off, um, or it could be that there's still some partial collapse allowing snoring, um, but enough such that it isn't complete. And, and the one thing I didn't mention, Jeff, that there are some, uh, while there's only one 
a tried and true test, there are certain symptoms that are common with sleep apnea. And so one of them is just chronic daytime sleepiness. It's very classic. And the other is when you do wake up, you feel unrefreshed, although you've been in bed perhaps for what is the recommended time of eight hours and so forth. And so that unrefreshed feeling or uh, chronic daytime sleepiness, headache, depression, some of these are, are some of the very common symptoms that we see in people with untreated sleep apnea. Tell me more about the, the testing procedure. Sure. Uh, I'm curious, you know, do you necessarily have to go spend the night at a facility? Is there a way to do it at home? And, and what do the results look like? What, what kind of document or chart do, do you see? It's a great question. And uh, so the, the best, most reliable results are going to be with what we call a multi-channel sleep study, which is done at a sleep center, compared to some of the sleep studies that are done at home. And some of the sleep studies that are done at home um, uh, can be very useful, and it can, you can often um, uh, get access to a lot more people that way. But one of the things that a home sleep study doesn't do is the EEG. And the EEG is the measure, um, you know, it's the measure of brain waves, and it lets you know not only when you're asleep, but what phase of sleep you're in. And so the home sleep studies necessarily lack that, but they can tell you when you're not breathing, how many times you're not breathing. And so you can get that information and it's useful, um, but as a gold standard, there are the standalone sleep study facilities that give you the, the most complete results. And you get a printout. Uh, and generally there's a summary of how many times you stop breathing in the course of uh, uh, the sleep night, um, how low your oxygen level goes, and so you're able to rate or score how severe your sleep apnea is. Let's take a look at another viewer question. This is from Heather. Hi, I was wondering what type of sleep disorders affect children and how would we know if our child was suffering from a sleep disorder? Thank you. Well, the sleep disorder that would affect a little child like that is probably another, uh, another ball game entirely. But I was surprised before with the, the phone call about the, uh, the youngster with, with confirmed sleep apnea. What, what's the earliest you could have that? Oh, it can happen very early in life. And, and sometimes uh, it may be due to cranial facial abnormalities as well, um, with, again, the most common reasons would be enlarged tonsils and adenoids, which are going to happen anywhere from one, two, three years old up until often six or seven years old and even beyond. So sleep apnea in children is, is very common, and we see a lot of it. Let's go out to uh, Talbot County. Daniel on the line. Daniel, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, Hi. I'm 79 years old, and uh, two years ago, I spent two nights in the local hospital with a sleep apnea, and they gave me a mask. That didn't work, so they took my tonsils out. I was 77 years old. And I still can't sleep right now. What I do now is go, I went to Walmart and bought a uh, five hour of sleeping pills every 30 days. I sleep good now. Daniel, thank you for the phone call. L listen to the response on the air if, if you would. Is a sleeping pill a good idea? Um, it's not, unfortunately. And to date, there's no recommended medication that is effective for treating obstructive sleep apnea. Because the concern it, would be that actually that you get too relaxed and you've worsened your sleep apnea. You said the same thing about, about alcohol Correct. earlier b before bedtime. Correct. And so uh, those are things, part of the, uh, what contributes to that collapse is that the actual tone of the walls of the back of your throat, it becomes less and more flaccid. And so it becomes more collapsible. So anything that you do that contributes to decreasing the tone will only increase the likelihood of sleep apnea. How do people without this avoid getting it? Uh, sounds like an awful lot of trouble. I mean, there's no exercise to do to strengthen the tone of whatever's back there. Sure, well, there are some things. One, um, you can pick your parents. <laughs> some of this <laughs> <little> is late, <laughs> uh, genetic, but in the absence of doing that, um, still, one of the most common risk factors is obesity and excessive weight. And so weight loss um, and regular exercise clearly are known to help with that tone and to reduce the excess of soft tissue back there that leads to collapse. Very good. Dr. Rod Taylor is with the University of Maryland. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.